Uh, I'm Jonathan Rudenberg, and I work on Flynn. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about automating databases safely. Flynn is an easy-to-use platform as a service. Uh, it has everything you need to run your apps without writing any custom infrastructure glue, without configuring things, and it's very easy to install and use. Uh, we have a lot of things that you would expect out of a 12-factor focused platform as a service. So we do git push build pack deploys so that you don't have to write any custom code to deploy your applications. We load balance HTTP and terminate TLS across your applications. We aggregate the logs that come out of the applications. And everything in Flynn is highly available, including the applications you deploy on top of it. We also have some other features that you're not going to find in every other stateless platform. So we can load balance TCP or even UDP. Um, we can do service discovery with DNS. And since we have an overlay network in Flynn, every container gets a cluster routable IP address. And you can just use well-known ports in your apps. And you don't have to rewrite them to talk to new service discovery systems. Flynn is entirely self-bootstrapping and self-hosting which means that you can use the same uh, control plane that we use to deploy applications to manage Flynn itself. The only thing running outside of a container in Flynn is the actual container runner. Everything else is deployed and managed using the Flynn APIs. And finally, the feature that we're going to be talking about today is automatically configured, highly available databases with automatic failover that doesn't lose data. Um, the databases that I'm focusing on right now are Postgres, MySQL, and very soon MongoDB. Uh, we, there are lots of other databases that are newer that uh, you could deploy that you know, are clustered out of the box, but there are many, many applications that already use Postgres or MySQL, and there's good reasons why you would want to continue using, say, Postgres. When um, talking about uh, databases and doing automatic failovers, the main consideration is safety. And um, by safety, I mean I want the database to uh, behave as if it is just this single node. And when a failover happens, I don't want the applications to have to reason about data loss or um, what can go wrong when a failover happens. I want to maintain the consistency model of a single node at that database. So let's look at an example. I have two database instances. It doesn't really matter what database they are, um, A and B. I'm going to write a value into database A. And that value will be stored in the database and confirmed back to the client that the write succeeded. After this happens, it replicates that value to the second instance. That value is then written, and we can move forward. At this point, if something goes wrong with the, uh, the first instance, A, I can actually safely move from instance A to instance B in the client configuration, but it is still there. We can talk to it. This is fine. This is asynchronous replication. Let's do another write. This time, uh, I write, and that write is confirmed to the client, but before the write is replicated to instance B, the instance A goes away. It fails in some way. The process crashes, the network's partitioned, something happens. We've actually lost data at this point. I can't reconfigure the client to talk to the second instance uh, without like, considering what data was lost. Um, so this is not safe. There's another failure that we need to worry about, and that is a network partition. Um, a partition is, can happen in a variety of ways. In this case, I've got some of my clients talking to one instance and some of them talking to the other instance. And the replication is blocked for what, some reason. When I write data into database A, it's acknowledged to the client. When I write in data on the other side of the partition into database B, it is also acknowledged to the client, and we have split brain. Our data is corrupt, and we no longer have consistency. Um, 
Prep data is no fun if you are storing data that users are writing, if you are storing you know, financial transactions like orders, if you're storing things like billable metrics or audit logs. Um, this is a problem. Think about what will happen to the data if you are storing it and it gets corrupt or lost. Partitions aren't just caused by network hardware failures. Things like uh, your language's garbage collector can actually cause a partition. Even in something like a client misconfiguration, so if you do a, uh, an, a rollout with configuration management or in service discovery and some of the clients see one database and the other ones see a different instance, then that is actually a partition. Uh, they happen very often in the real world. And since they're a problem, we have to deal with them. So there's another type of replication that we can use. Uh, instead of confirming a write to a client immediately, what we can do is we can send it to the second instance, B, and write it to B, and then confirm back to the client that we are successful. Um, with synchronous replication, when instance A encounters a failure, the write fails, and instead of confirming the write, we never confirmed it to the client. So the data is in our second instance that the client thinks is there, and the second write failed. This is fine. It's safe since we never confirmed it in the first place. Let's look at a partition with synchronous replication. Because the write needs to be replicated to the second instance uh, before it is confirmed to the client, we never actually confirm the, uh, the partitioned writes. So if I try to write to instance A, I can't actually write because instance A can't talk to instance B. Um, this is actually what we want. It is safety during partitions. So synchronous replication is the core of how we are going to do these automatic failovers reliably. We also need uh, some other things in order to make this work. We need service discovery. Um, so in Flynn, we have a component called DiscoverD, and um, it provides service discovery for the whole system. So instances are registered in service discovery, and they heartbeat to DiscoverD. And we expose that over HTTP and DNS. And it also stores some metadata. It's backed by Raft, so we can safely store small bits of data that we can use to reason about our database cluster in there. We're also going to store the leader. So DiscoverD exposes uh, a DNS entry leader.postgres.discoverty in this case. And this will always point at the leader of the cluster. The problem is, is that we actually need to know which host is the leader. And in order to keep track of that safely, we need a state machine. The state machine ensures that our cluster is configured properly and only safe transitions happen. Flynn's state machine is actually based on work that was done at Joint. Um, and I ended up rewriting a state machine that they designed in Go and genericized it. Uh, a huge thanks to them for like figuring out the original moving parts for this. Uh, our system consists of three peers. We have a primary, which accepts writes and it serves up reads. It replicates data synchronously to the synchronous peer. Uh, and then the sync peer replicates asynchronously to an async peer. A given async peer can actually have uh, more than one, um, uh, we can have more than one async peer. So you can actually have another async peer chained off of the last peer. Um, this cluster is a replication chain. And it actually is, makes it much easier to reason about failovers. We have five states. Um, so there are three active states and two inactive states. We have the primary, which is the only state that accepts writes, and it replicates synchronously to the sync. The sync is the only state that can be, become the primary. And then we have an async, which can transition into a sync. Uh, so the, the, it looks like this. A peer starts out unassigned, 
And if it is the first peer in the cluster, it, uh, it becomes the primary. And it waits for other peers to show up. Um, it assigns the next peer to show up to be the sync, and all subsequent peers become asyncs chained off of the last peer that was added to the cluster. The final state is deposed, which is what happens to a primary when it, it finds out that a sync has taken over for it. Um, this, the state of the cluster is actually pretty small. We keep track of uh, everything in Discovery, and the primary under normal circumstances is the only thing that is writing. We uh, move atomically from one generation to the next. So each time the primary or the sync is changed, a new generation is declared by the primary. All of the other peers in the cluster get updates from Discovery when the state changes and they act accordingly. So uh, let's go through a state transition and see how this works. Um, this cluster was working, but the sync has just failed. Clients can read from the primary, but they can't write because there's no sync. So as soon as the primary sees that the sync is gone, it, uh, it declares a new generation and changes the async in the state to be a sync. As soon as the async sees this, it, um, it, starts, uh, it, it basically starts replicating from the primary. And as soon as replication has caught up, clients will be able to uh, write data again. This typically only takes a few seconds and because the async will have most of the data already. At some point in the future, another peer will appear. Um, it may be that the sync was just partitioned and it, uh, it comes back later and it will see that it is no longer the sync and be unassigned. Um, or if the process actually crashed, then the scheduler will start a new instance. As soon as a new peer registers in service discovery, the primary will see it and it will add it to the list of asyncs. It will then start replicating from the last peer in the chain, the sync. The other major failure that can happen is losing a primary. Um, this is something that we really need to be careful about. When a sync detects an unavailable primary, it's going to declare a new generation with itself as the primary and the first async as the new sync. This will only happen if a few other conditions are met. Um, it's not going to depose the primary if there's no other peer to become the new sync because it would not be able to accept writes. It's better just to wait for the primary to show up. It also won't do this if the write ahead log never caught up with the current generation. So if a transition has happened recently and the sync never caught up, it doesn't actually know that it has all of the data that's on the primary. Um, so this, uh, as soon as the sync, the new sync, which was previously the async, catches up, um, it will update uh, Discovery and um, clients can write again. This typically only takes a few seconds and smart clients uh, under some circumstances can read during this process. In the future, the scheduler will start a new process and that new peer will become the async. Um, so this, this whole cluster also has a set of states, which is um, under the vast majority of scenarios, reads are possible. When the cluster isn't in the midst of responding to a failover, we can still write data. And uh, in some very specific, limited scenarios, we uh, are unavailable. The most important part is that this is safe and you can use databases that you're already using like MySQL and Postgres without changing how you're thinking about databases. Data is never lost and failovers are ha handled automatically in seconds. Um, configuring this is uh, relatively straightforward for Postgres. We end up wrapping the Postgres process uh, in a manager and doing some configuration. The core of the configuration is just turning on synchronous replication. Um, there's lots of small tweaks and considerations, but for the most part, it's just pretty simple. You plug it into the state machine and everything's happy. Um, MySQL is a bit trickier. 
So uh, we actually use uh, MariaDB, and there's a semi-sync replication plugin. And that, uh, that plugin works kind of like synchronous replication, but under some situations it actually falls back to asynchronous replication, which is not what we want. That's bad. Um, so we can toggle some flags, and the, um, the most important thing is that there's a timeout. After a, uh, a certain amount of time, it will actually fall back to asynchronous replication. And so we just set that to half a billion years, and that's good enough for our use case. Um, the last one is MongoDB. And if you're familiar with how MongoDB does replication or MongoDB at all, it's, it's really tricky. And there's a lot of obscure details going on here that I, uh, I didn't actually build the MongoDB appliance. Uh, one of our other engineers did. And so I think that's a topic for another talk. Um, <laughs> it's, it gets really hairy really fast. Um, in Flynn, we actually uh, can just run a single command to get a database. So you can just run Flynn resource add MySQL, and it will provision a MySQL database on the Flynn cluster, and it will actually configure the application too. So you can see here, it's generated a database and user and password and so on, but it's pointing at the, uh, the MySQL host of leader.mariadb.discoverd. And this will always point at the primary in the MySQL cluster. And if something goes wrong, clients just need to reconnect. It's a zero TTL DNS entry. You don't have to change your clients at all to work with this. There's other commands um, that we've exposed. So you can just take a backup of a database with a single command down to your local machine. And you can also restore it, again, with a single command. So you don't have to SSH into a database somewhere or like try to get into the container or whatever. Um, you can also get into a console for the database. And this is actually interesting because you don't need the local database tools installed on your local machine. So you don't need the PSQL client installed locally. We actually spin that up in a container on the cluster and uh, just proxy the terminal out. So you can interact with the Postgres database on your local machine without ever installing Postgres or even caring where the cluster is or the connection details for it and so on. Um, OK, so a few final points in conclusion. Please don't use asynchronous replication unless you really, really know what you're doing. It, uh, it's very easy to lose data, and it just makes everyone sad. Um, also, I like to think of containers as a building block, not a solution. Uh, containers make things easier in some cases. They make things way more complicated in some scenarios. Uh, but in general, they make some things that were hard a bit easier. Uh, but they're only as useful as the things that we build on top of them. It's very easy to lose sight of what you were trying to do and just kind of get buried in container formats and schedulers and so on. So don't forget what you're actually working on and build things on top of containers. Um, Thanks for listening. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. Uh, those are the, the handles and URLs and so on. And please come find me if you'd like a Flynn sticker and so on.